what do you think will happen if you jumped into a hole that you dug right through the center of the earth well today's topic of gravitational fields can help us answer that and we'll look at what would happen a little bit later so in this video for a level physics we're going to look at a few key definitions to start off we're going to look at gravitational potential as well we're going to look at newton's law of gravity gravitation um, and we're going to look at different types of field um, as well as a couple of derivations one to do with satellites uh, which is deriving new uh, kepler's third law um, and also a derivation for escape velocity uh, both of which come up in a-level papers fairly consistently now the first thing we're going to define today is what is a field in particular a gravitational field um, now this definition applies to electric fields as well you just have to tweak a couple of words uh, we'd say a, a gravitational field is a region around an object of mass where another mass experiences a force so without mass in, in both objects there's not going to be a force between them that's key to understanding gravitational fields now what about field lines these things I've drawn here acting towards the object so field lines would show the direction a mass or a test mass would take when placed in that field so here the mass is going to go towards the planet indicated by the arrow shown on the paper Okay, next definition that we're going to look at is particular to gravitational fields. We're going to look at gravitational field strength, which we use a small case g uh, to define. Um, it's defined by this equation here. So g equals f over m, which you might recognize from year 12 is the same as basically weight equals mg, just rearranged. Um, so it's one of those uh, definitions we can use an equation to help us with. So defined in words, it is force per unit mass, um, not just force per unit mass, but acting on a small mass placed in a field or a gravitational field in this case. Okay, now we should know um, g for planet Earth is equal to 9.81, um, so that's in newtons per kilogram using this equation. It also has units of meters per second squared if you're talking about acceleration due to gravity. So next let's talk about different types of fields. So um, most of the mechanics you've done prior to this topic will have been based around things happening close to the surface of the Earth. Uh, for example, people throwing an object or, or um, you know things on the scale of meters, so five meters uh, 10 meters etc and now there are different types of field now this type of field which you come across already um, is different to the one you see on the left the one on the left is called a radial field and this one I've just drawn here is an example of a uniform field so uniform in physics normally means constant or the same and in this case it means g or field strength is constant whereas for a radial field uh, g changes with distance we'll look at how that happens um, shortly but the further away you go g does actually decrease now um, when you're close to the planet uh, the uh, surface the earth and um, we can actually assume that the field is uniform even if it's actually not um, now the reason is because obviously the earth is round it's curved when you get very close to it it's almost practically um, a straight line so for all intents and purposes it is uniform however if you climb a mountain or a really high hill you will notice g can change slightly now there's a lot of equations in this topic so we're going to make a note of them in the bottom right of the screen just so we can see how they all link together a bit later on so let's move on to Newton's law of gravitation, a really fundamental law developed by, uh, guess who, Isaac Newton. Um, it's one of those uh, laws that was measured first before it was kind of formulated. Um, so it was done using um, measurements of stars and planets in the night sky. Um, and it describes how two masses interact. And it says there's a force between these masses. Um, and the force between the masses depends on two things. Uh, first of all, it depends on, um, and it's always attractive, uh, just to note down here, it's never uh, repulsive. We haven't found repulsive of gravity doesn't fit into our thinking yet um, but those forces are proportional to uh, the masses so which kind of makes sense if you have a heavier planet you're going to have a greater force between them and um, it's proportional to the mass of both objects it's inversely proportional so meaning um, it goes up if this goes down uh, to the distance between two objects or between the two masses now in particular is not just inversely proportional to that is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them hence known as an inverse square law in particular it's the different distance between the center of masses of those shapes Okay, so let's start formulating this into an equation. Um, so uh, in um, algebraic form, uh, F is proportional to M1 times M2. So we're gonna rewrite that um, uh, expression for masses and we say it's proportional to the product of the masses. So the two masses multiplied together. Um, and putting those things together, uh, we get an equation looks like this. So F equals capital G, M1, M2 divided by R squared. Sometimes you see capital M and little case M, um, it's the same thing. Now this value G is a constant, it's been measured um, 
kilogram to be 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Um, now that's been empirically measured. It's pretty small, which usually indicates that you know, the force, uh, gravitational forces are very, very small almost always. Now the relationship works like this. Um, if I square, if I double the distance, force gets quartered. If I double the mass, the force uh, doubles as well. Okay, let's come back to gravitational field strength. So we defined this earlier as force per unit mass or F over M. Now we've got an expression for F. We're going to use this to come up with another expression for gravitational field strength. So um, this value F here, we said it equals to GM1 M2 over R squared. So if I rewrite this whole thing, um, it's really helpful in this topic to know where the equations come from, even though obviously you don't need to memorize them. Uh, so if you divide that whole expression by m, one of the masses is going to cancel. That's the mass of the object um, or the thing that's orbiting the, the larger mass. Um, and we are left with 1m gm over r squared, um, where that m that's left is the mass of, like for example, the planet or the sun, whatever um, is uh, the field we are measuring. So g equals big G m over r squared is our value for gravitational field strength. Now, um, let's look what a graph of this would look like. And if I was to have G and R on the x-axis, um, what would the shape of the graph be like overall? So um, we're going to um, have a look at the relationship. We said earlier G um, F is inversely proportional to R squared. It's the same with G. So our graph looks a bit like this. And the dotted line there would be the radius of the Earth. So it's at its maximum, 9.81. However, I said at the start of the video, what if you were to dig a hole? What if you were to go um, deeper and deeper inside the Earth so that the radius actually decreased? Well, interesting things start to happen there. Because let's say you're at this random point. Um, you would have mass of the Earth on different sides of you. So some on the left, some on the right, some below you, and some above you. So those, um, the effect of those forces would actually start to cancel out. And if you were right in the center, you'd have equal amounts of mass on all sides, meaning you're effectively weightless. Um, you wouldn't be able to get out. You wouldn't fall through to the other side. You'd just stay there forever and ever until someone was able to drag you out, meaning that's when you actually have zero G. So how to explain this mathematically? It is pretty cool, but you can prove it um, if you use our expression for gravitational field strength. So inside the Earth, G equals uh, capital G M over R squared. But assuming it's uniform density, um, which is not, but it's an assumption we can make here to generalize, um, which is density equals mass over volume. The volume of a sphere is 4 over 3 pi R cubed. So if we substitute the expression for mass in, which is density, times that volume, uh, we'll notice actually that R squared on the bottom can cancel with the R cubed on the top, leaving us with G equals um, 4 pi times by the density times by r um, over 3. So that then gives us the relationship g is proportional to r when inside the Earth's surface, or when r is lower than um, the radius of the Earth. So our next bit of our graph looks like this, meaning g goes to 0 uh, linearly um, when the radius of the Earth has been um, gone below. So next thing we're going to look at is gravitational potential and potential energy, um, which are two really important concepts to define carefully. Okay, definitions are usually worth one, um, definitely two marks, um, and it's really important you can define them to be able to use them in equations. So we'll talk about potential energy first. Now, normally when we've talked about potential energy in year 12 or at GCSE, we're throwing objects up, um, so it gains gravitational potential energy uh, because it gains height. Now, if you were to take this to uh, the extreme, if you were to throw something really, 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 really far, okay in a uniform field then it must have infinite potential energy um, the further it gets if it gets to an infinite distance okay um, so because work done equals force times distance therefore we can then say the force is going to be infinite as well on that object which doesn't really make sense okay so what we then do is we say well if you've got a planet or an object um, where I'm exert where I'm throwing an object um, away from it um, the force has to kind of decrease the further away it got because we've said force is proportional to the inverse of the square of R. So those two things are pretty kind of contradictory at the minute. So how we get around that um, is we say that potential energy must increase with distance. However, um, it must be zero at what we say infinity. Okay, when they're infinitely far away, it has to be zero. So how we get around this is we say gravitational potential energy values must be therefore be negative. Okay, because if they're negative, they can get higher, i.e. closer to zero the further away you go, but then they eventually do reach zero if you go to infinite distance. So the definition for gravitational potential energy is the work done moving an object from infinity to a point in a field or in a gravitational field. Really important to say that word um, infinity. You could say energy required instead of work done, uh, but work done is easy enough to remember. Next is the uh, one that people always get mixed up on is gravitational potential. Um, now, gravitational potential um, is very similar to the idea of potential difference when we uh, look at electric fields, um, and it's defined in a very similar way, but note the slight differences here. So it's defined as work done per unit mass. 
So work done per unit mass um, in moving a object um, from infinity to a point in the field. So definitely one to commit to memory because um, it is one that's really, um, you can't really imagine it. It's one of those things you've got to define um, with that definition and with an equation. So in equation form, um, this is given to you in your equation sheet, potential capital V equals minus GM over R. It's negative for the same reason we just mentioned potential energy is negative. Now, um, if I wanted to work out the uh, potential energy, that is work given by work done equals mass times by the potential, um, or potential equals work done per unit mass. We just talked about that equation. Um, so you, in the AQA, you do have to derive it. So therefore, it's going to equal GM over R times by M, which is GM, small case M, over R. Um, that's potential energy or work done. Um, and the big M we're talking about here is mass of the planet um, as opposed to mass of the object. Okay, So do make sure you can uh, derive that one easily um, if you're doing AQA, so it's not not given to you on the equation sheet. Okay, so as we mentioned before, these are always negative, these values, you'll find negative graphs, um, and it's just one thing to remember, the negative isn't nothing to be afraid of, just as how we define it with infinity being at zero energy. So let's make a note of how um, some of these different equations can relate together because we've got one more to derive. So um, g equal, uh, little g gravitational field strength equals gm over r squared and potential equals gm over r. So using those two equations, we can actually see that g equals the potential equation divided by r, meaning that will be an r squared on the bottom. And this is the last relationship, which is that gravitational field strength is equal to the potential gradient or the change in potential divided by r, meaning that will be the gradient of a um, vr graph. So really important in this topic is that you can link together different equations together. You obviously don't need to memorize them, but it does help to know where they've come from um, so that you can answer questions involving graphs and when you've got different values given to you. So I'm going to take an example here. So work done equals um, GMM over R um, and force equals GMM over R squared. So we know that work done equals force times distance. We're going to say R here. Um, so actually work done uh, being force times distance, our equation for force times R cancels the R squared becomes R, which is the expression for work done. So it's one of those ways you can see how two different equations link together um, so that you can help solve graph equations, which come up a lot in gravitational and electric fields. Like this one here, let's say I've got potential and how it varies with R. Um, it's negative and I'm asked to calculate G, gravitational field strength. So here that's going to equal the gradient because G equals V over R. What if I was asked to find this time for a force distance graph, if I was asked to calculate the work done? or it could be gravitational potential. So what I do in that case, I know that work done equals force times distance. So in a graph that represents the area between two points, between two Rs. So I can use the area to work out work done, divide by mass if I'm trying to find potential. So let's finish off this topic talking about two different derivations that come up. Let's start with escape velocity. So the idea behind escape velocity um, is if I'm standing on a planet, um, let's say planet Earth, and I throw an object off, what is the minimum velocity needed for it to escape um, the Earth's gravitational field? You can't just say to uh, get uh, escape gravity, uh, but escape the Earth's gravitational field, i.e. when g would equal zero. Um, so what we do in this case, we say, well, let's think about energy. Um, as I throw it up, it's going to be losing kinetic energy, it's going to be slow down is going to be gaining gravitational potential energy. So if I write down both those equations, and I'm assuming there's no air resistance uh, in this case, um, however much kinetic energy it loses, it's going to gain gravitational. So the equation for work done, or GPE, is going to be equal to GMM over R, deriving that for using potential. We know kinetic energy equals half mv squared. So I'm going to balance those two equations out. We're going to do some cancelling. One of the m's cancel, and I'm going to solve for v. So v squared in this case is 2GM over R, um, and then for v, I just square root the whole thing which is pretty nice going. You, don't need, uh, you do need to know how to get there for this equation. Um, it doesn't get given to you in the exam. Now, as well as this, you could be asked to express it in terms of uh, small case g, gravitational field strength. So g equals um, big G m over r squared. Um, so in this case, um, what that means is I could uh, replace one of the r's to the left-hand side, um, and I could say, okay, g m over r equals r times by field strength. Therefore, I could replace those in my value to give root 2 g r. Now, if I plug in the values for planet Earth, um, for mass and for radius, I get an escape velocity of around about 11,000 meters per second, which is pretty high. Now, if I'm a rocket taking off from the Earth, I do not need to reach that um, velocity. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for it, um, mainly because they're burning fuel, meaning they are adding extra acceleration to their journey. Um, so it's not just an initial velocity. They're also losing mass as they get higher and higher for the same reason, which is really good news for the space industry. 
Right, last iteration uh, we're going to do is um, called Kepler's Third Law, and it relates to objects orbiting um, a planet. Um, so we're going to consider a satellite, satellite here. Um, it could be ob objects orbiting a star as well, um, but um, we're going to talk about planet here. And the relationship Kepler's Third Law says that the time period squared is proportional to the radius of orbit cubed. Um, so where on earth does that come from? Um, well, let's consider an object going in circle around um, a planet, um, and we can consider the forces that are acting on it. So sometimes things questions will tell you that sometimes you might be expected to just know that straight away so we start off with the centripetal force equation which is mv squared over r from the circular motion topic we say that's provided by gravity so therefore that equals capital g mm over r squared let's cancel some of the little r's and one of the r's and r squared and gives us an equation v squared equal capital g div m divided by r so we're talking about um, an object orbiting with a velocity. Now we're going to have to get time period into this equation. How we do it is we say velocity equals 2 pi r over the time period. And we've got to square that whole expression. So therefore 2 squared is 4, pi squared, etc, r squared, and we divide by t squared uh, equals gm over r. Now once we've got to that point, it's just rearranging carefully. You should be able to spot the r times to the left hand side here gives us r cubed. Um, so 4 pi squared r cubed um, equals gm t squared. Um, I'm going to divide um, the uh, left hand side, sorry right hand side by 4 pi squared to give me that whole expression in brackets. Now it's really important to notice we've proved that r cubed is proportional to t squared but only because all those are constants. g is a number, the mass of the planet is the same, 4 pi squared is just a number as well. So um, there we go, that's how we derive that relationship. Now how to use it um, is let's say I've got two satellites at different distances, different r's away from a planet um, and basically uh, we are trying to find out um, what like the the time period is. So for each object r cubed over t squared has to be constant. So in that case um, therefore r cubed of a divided by t squared of a has to equal r cubed of b divided by times squared of b. Um, I think that's the easiest way um, I would go about doing it. You could find constant proportionality um, but it will be the same thing. So I hope you found that video useful. Um, keep watching there's going to be an exam question coming up uh, that will help you put into practice uh, your understanding.